Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Anime Explorations Podcast, a monthly um, anime book club style podcast where we watch an anime series and then talk about it and give our various thoughts. My name is Alex and I'm joined by... I'm David. And I am Tora. And for our first episode, we are going with a fairly recent anime. Um, keep your hands off Azokin. This show was aired streaming in uh, 2020. Um, during the pan, uh, started before the pandemic and kind of carried over into it, um, into, into the lockdown period. And I figured this was a decent show to start with for the reasons of one, it gets into how anime get does explanations of things in terms of like when American movies do movies about movies, they tend to be kind of self-indulgent and that sort of thing. You, you would, if you watched the artist, you don't, you never, you did not learn what a key grip does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the other one with this is this show was incredibly well regarded. Um, this show yeah, was, I can see why <laughs> like, the New York times put this as one of their top television series of 2020, not animated television series to all television series of the year. Um, and Elvis Costello uh, in a uh, interview about what he'd been doing over the pandemic mentioned that this was one of his favorite shows he'd been watching, um, both praising the narrative and how it describes filmmaking and also really digging the, the, uh, the music. So, I mean, Elvis Costello likes your opening credits music. I think that's pretty good praise. Yeah, the opening credits were... I mean, I liked them. They reminded me of the gorillas. And not in a bad way. I mean, I, I love the gorillas. Well, I did. It, it's been several years since I've listened to them or watched their stuff, but... What I liked about the opening credits is that the song is called Easy Breezy, and... The animation techniques that they used, you can see that it was a lot of repeated cuts and silhouetting. And so it was like they're saying, we're not taking this opening too seriously and neither should you. The animation is easy. The song is fun. You know, um, it, it does kind of I felt like it didn't totally match the show 100 percent, except in some of the more exuberant parts when they're in their imaginary world, um, because I found the show a little bit more. I don't know, thoughtful, introspective. Uh, as, as a creator, some of the moments in the show that I enjoyed the most were when they were talking about the process of creation and the frustrations inherent within it. Um, and so I also, I think it was great to start the show in such kind of a fun, lighthearted way. And then in the show itself, it kind of really digs into a little bit more serious, introspective topics. At least that was my read on it as a creative person so <laughs> yeah and there's not a ton of mood whiplash in that in with the exception of i think the last episode uh, episode 12 they don't really start in a heavy place at it any at all so yeah we should really quick give a rundown of what the premise is and who our main characters are so Please, this before i get us way off track <laughs> so uh this is set at a what feels like an unspecified point in the not too distant future in terms of chunks of the setting and it follows um three high school students i'm going to mis probably going to mispronounce a portion of these names and then i apologize in advance um midori asakusa um sayaka kanamori and subame uh, misasaki uh, midori and sayaka have been friends for a while uh, midori is very much into anime and animation um she likes doing like these big elaborate sketches of um city environments and that sort of thing. But she is not necessarily great at drawing characters. Um, Subame is more financially interested in business minds. She's got the lobes for business, as the, the Ferengi might say. Um, and oh, so, uh, that's Sayaka. Uh, Siaka. Subame is... Sorry, Sayaka. Yeah. I apologize. Uh, Subame yeah. is a fashion model and daughter of a couple wealthy actors. And uh, she's originally prohibited from joining the anime club by her father, but with the intervention of Midori and Sayaka, uh, she gets an opportunity to make animation uh, when 
the three of them decide to form the school's um, film club, or Azo Kid. Uh, and over the course of the series, we, they, we see them make three animated shorts. Um, one as a proof of concept for the... For, for the Azokin itself yep. to secure funding for from the uh, student council. Yep. A second funded uh, or um, commissioned by one of the clubs at the uh, school. And then a third that is a original creation um, backed by like a local chamber of commerce, but made for what is effectively serial numbers filed off Comic Hat, complete with the with the, the selling it at what is clearly a, do, a again. Uh, Tokyo Big Sight. Mm-hmm. It might be a, mod- a variation on it. So these three characters really embody kind of the creative roles of the director, the artist, and the producer. Um, and I really liked that. Um, <laughs> it was very honest about how you can't create something in a vacuum. And then they actually outright state, which is probably like the most important thing I learned in art school, which was having an idea isn't worth anything if you can't turn it into a finished product, right? So it's all about their struggles in making that happen and coming at it from three very different perspectives, but coming together to create something great, which I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. I, I really like this, and um, the director for the show was um, Masami Yuasa, uh, and he has a very distinctive um, style with some very real visual flair. Some of his other stuff he's done in recent years, um, the Tatami Galaxy, which I admit I have not seen, it's on my to-watch list, uh, is probably his most high-profile work in terms of actually breaking through to a degree of mainstream, even in the West, was he directed Devilman Crybaby for uh, Netflix which is the exact total polar opposite of this show in every possible respect. <laughs> yeah. I would, to, to put it mildly. Um, this also has a lot of really overt shout outs to uh, the works of Hayao Miyazaki. Um, yeah. The opening pays a little, like the, like the opening shots of the first episode pay a few tributes to um, a little bit of spirited away, actually. Um, yes. And then like, the inspirational work that draws uh, Midori and uh, Tsubame together, and to a degree also Sayaka, is a more or less cribbed version of a replication of shots from uh, the future boy Conan, which was one of uh, Miyazaki's earliest television series that he did. Yes, when I was watching it, I was like, is this supposed to be Nausicaa? Because I've never actually seen Future Boy Conan. And then I went online and looked into it a little more, and I was like, aha, (laughs) that's clearly what they're pointing at here. Yeah, but, I mean, it had shots from a bunch of different Ghibli stuff, like Mm -hmm. (sighs) Castle of Cagliostro. (laughs) Yeah, Um, probably one of my favorite bits from this um, as far as like the, 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 of all the Miyazaki references, is um, there's a shot where um, uh, Midori is kind of boasting about what you've done. You put out your third project. You know you're a veteran director, and she's basically just dressed like Miyazaki with like a fake beard with a fake mustache. Yeah, beard. that yes. was so good. <laughs> I was like, that, that's Miyazaki, right? I mean, there, there's no one else that could be. Yeah, <laughs> there's probably other people it could be, but I mean, uh, it, it's. Almost um, Tezuka, but in order to be Tezuka, you have to wear a beret. <laughs> that's the signifier. <laughs> yeah, like, that's in his personal portrait. He does in, in his appendices and that sort of stuff in his manga. He always draws himself wearing a beret. Always the beret. Love it. <laughs> I think he also like wore the beret a bunch in real life with all the photographs I've seen from him and like public appearances. And when he came to San Diego Comic Con one time, uh, he's always wearing the beret. So. In just... terms, oh, go ahead. Oh, I think it was just his thing. In terms of um, kind of the first opening shots of the show that you were talking about, the Miyazaki references, I was like, oh, you know, this location is really cool. The backgrounds are very elaborate. It kind of reminded me of a little bit of other stories about 
kind of mystical schools, like in the webcomic Gunner Krieg Court, <laughs> or even like Hogwarts a little bit if you want to take it that way. But this location where you kind of have the sense just from looking at it that magical things could happen here. And then as I got more into the show and it showed um, Asakusa's sketchbook and all of the concepting she'd been doing, I was like, okay, the artist clearly has a sketchbook just like this, One of someone who worked on the show, and they put some of these backgrounds into the show. They're so cool. They show so much like thought and design. Um, actually, if you watch through the whole show, I was paying attention to the backgrounds and I was just blown away by how elaborate they were and how well thought out, how many different styles of architecture they were putting into this one location to make it visually interesting everywhere you looked. It was so cool. But also consistent throughout. But it was it was consistent location. Like, yeah. You got <laughs> used to these locations. You're like, okay, well, from there you can go to there. I mean, as I'm watching, you know, because they're it's very clearly been thought out. I'm building a map in my head of this entire place, and it's fantastically done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then I, they bring that into their meta anime that they're making within the anime, which is also super cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I I have not read the manga for this. I know that some like some manga creators get like varying degrees of heavy detail for their backgrounds and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I I do th- think that there's a the, the sense of dynamism for some of these shots here that's definitely distinctive to, um, if not just particularly. Uh, Yuasa, but also some of the other works I've seen from Science Sorrow, which is the animation studio who put out the show as well. Um, definitely comes up with that as well. Um, also my I was worth- first... E- Go ahead. I was first exposed to this director through the episode that they did for Adventure Time, actually. Um, and I didn't know that Adventure Time was doing a collaboration with other directors. And t- I just like was watching the show and this episode came up that was completely different stylistically from all the other episodes. And I had to look it up to see what was going on. But it's just it was just such a beautiful kind of complete thought of an episode. Um, and a lot of the things in Aizuken kind of resonated with me the same way in that a lot of thoughts and concepts that they bring up whether they the characters state a concept or it is something completely in the background will come up again later and it gives the whole thing this beautiful kind of closed circle feeling at the end and at the same time you know that the story is not over for these characters and they're going to go somewhere from here so i always like to shout that out when i see it in media because i feel like that sort of setup and payoff has been de-emphasized in modern filmmaking and it is it's so fundamental to filmmaking i always want to praise it when i see it <laughs> um i think also probably the other thing, important thing to talk about the show is how it does the, um depicts the inner creative life of the characters because there's these interesting i wouldn't quite call them walter mitty-esque um sort of fantasy sequences that we get when they're imagining concepts and sketches and that sort of thing where we will go inside the characters' drawings and sketchbooks, and the physical character will be present in there, but the environments they're working with are line drawings, the line drawings and sketches and that sort of thing, and they will become more fleshed out as the characters describe the ideas. And among the really great touches I like here, I like this with this is with the sound design, the um, or when they are in the fantasy world, the sound design shifts, shifts from conventional sound designs to uh, people making sound, making sound effects. Like in, yes, like instead of having they spend, an... they spend a lot of time in character talking about the importance of sound design in their show, and yeah, it's obvious that the filmmakers really adopt that philosophy and take it to heart. I really love all of Asakusa in particular, her mouth sounds that she makes when she's trying to describe her grand ideas to people. She gets really into it. She makes all the sounds. She makes ex- like elaborate hand gestures, expansive gestures um, to convey her meaning. Um, Because filmmaking, of course, whether it's animated or live action, is not a static medium. Movement is so important um, through every piece of the process. And she just gets her whole body into it, and it's just a joy to watch. (laughs) And that fits well with leading into it. We haven't talked about Tsubami that much, but with her sort of, as we see her character background, um, where like She's trained by her parents and so forth as far as 
kind of motivated to becoming an actor and taking classes in ballet and movement and that sort of thing. But as like particularly with the, the episodes as we lead into, um, it wasn't Machete Girl. It was the um, uh, Mech anime, um, where we we sit where we see her taking all of that movement stuff that she'd done and and how like she was like very much into like the, the, while she was motivated to take the acting classes and that sort of thing because her, her, her yeah. parents were that but also she's then taking all of that and going I can this is important and useful to me because I want to animate and capture movement all kinds of movement in this way and um, yes yeah uh, just so everybody knows I went to art school um, <laughs> I graduated with a degree in illustration so my focus was on static images but I did have to take a couple of animation related classes including an acting for animators class. And I went into it kind of thinking, why am I here? I don't know if this is for me, but it actually turned out to be one of the most valuable classes that I took in my four years at art school. Because until you start to break down the different ways that people and objects move, you don't think about it. It's just part of your unconscious background world. It really takes conscious observation to observe how different people move differently, how objects move differently, how weight affects objects in space. Um, and so that, yeah, that was incredibly valuable for me. When the scene started of her in her acting class, the flashback that showed us she was taking this modeling course to teach her how to move, and she would sit down and draw the different movements in order to absorb and understand them. I was like, I, I had that experience kind of. So I was like, aha, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I've been through that mental process. It is not a hundred percent intuitive or easy, but the more you start to notice movement and how it works, um, just you can't unsee it after that everywhere. You're constantly fascinated by things like the arc of water as it's thrown out of a cup and stuff like that. So I really identified with Subame in that in that scene. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and Subame herself has this very interesting way of moving. Like that is one thing I will absolutely cannot stop praising the show for is every character is different, is unique, and. They don't move the same. Like they all have uh, all our three primary, you know, three main girls. They all have different body types and they all move differently. And Subame exemplifies this the most with her. I want to call it a punching run that she does, because whenever she's moving speed, she's moving her hands like she's punching forward. And it's just this really interesting thing. And I'm just want to know, OK, who did the animator know that did this? <laughs> And then the show brings up the fact that she holds her chopsticks differently from everyone else, um, which she only finds out after she has animated a scene with people eating, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> I think if you are if you are paying attention to movements, if you're conscious of movements like an animator is, then you do kind of develop quirkier movements almost as a side effect of observing how other people move. Because it's like, how would this picture change if the character led with their head when they walked as opposed to leading with their hips when they walked or leading with their shoulders when they walked, you know? You have to think about that kind of thing. And so, I, yeah, I, like David said, I love how each character has their own style of movement. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so the, this, this was... This was an absolute blast of a show to watch. Uh, I was also glad to... like. This is my third time watching it, I believe, because I watched it once when it came out. Um, during lockdown, I watched the show with my parents um, as a thing to do because we were, cause we're, we're all stuck inside and nothing to do. Sure. Uh, and... And it, everyone I've shown it for... The, now, since you are the second group I, I have recommended this show to, has absolutely enjoyed it. Um, one other like thing I wanted to mention here is the way also like mentioned about like from how them getting into the 
world of their of the animation designs and that sort of thing and as they flesh out the world the, the animation in the set in the sort of fantasy space gets fleshed out as well this also leads to like a, another like great follow-up step where once the once the finished product is done and you see people watching it where you they have this nice little stylistic flourish of various elements from the works of the story kind of start popping up in the world like in mm-hmm. um hold the machete tight which is the, the first short like a tank fires a, a shell and one of the people and the people in the, the auditorium where this is being screened looks over and there's a there's an empty tank shell like sitting on the floor next to them and yes that sort of thing just, it's just a great, but also fairly like easy way of showing that everyone is getting pulled into these worlds that these girls are creating. It's amazing. Um, you have mentioned that American works of film about filmmaking are often very self-indulgent. And I would agree with that. Um, I would say that the the Japanese works of film and animation that I've seen about film and animation usually tend to be about, I don't want to say the struggle of the artist, but about what it's like to be creative in a world that doesn't necessarily reward that. And you get both the really high highs of joy in creation and imagination that you get in Isaacen when the girls are creating their own fantasy worlds. And then you also get the really low lows of when your imagination bumps into reality. I think actually my favorite moment in the show is when Kanamori is going over to Asakusa and saying, time's up, you know, this is the deadline. Are you done yet or what? And Asakusa says, it's not so much that I'm done as that my passion has run into the wall of frustration and reality and complacence or something like that. That's something that every creative experiences at one point or another. <laughs> I mean, there's the reason the saying is, you know, no pieces art is ever completed, just abandoned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I, You can tell that the, the two creatives in the group, Asakusa and um, Mizuzaki, they're never going to be 100% satisfied with the finished product because that's how creative people are. And that's what, straight up what they showed in the show. I mean, mm-hmm. it was like everyone's like bl- blown away. And like after they after they show their shorts, they're always, OK, what? It, OK, that that was a problem there. We need to fix that. <clears throat> But I think um, I was comparing this this work in my head to Miyazaki's The Wind Rises because I consider The Wind Rises to be about a similar creative character who just wants to design and create beautiful things. And in that story, the creative runs up against the reality of his creations are going to be taken and used for war. So that is not the case in Aizuken, obviously. Thank goodness. Um, But they do run up into a lot of limitations. Like um, at the very beginning, there's Mizuzaki's parents' opposition to her working in anime. And then they run into difficulties with the student council. They run into difficulties with funding. Uh, Kanamori points out, you know, you worked this many hours. If we say that's like, you know, this many yen an hour you earned like 1.8 million but instead you only got this paltry amount right um and that is especially indicative of the japanese anime industry as a whole which does not in general treat its artists well um but i would say that the difference in aizuken is that the joy and the passion of these young people in creating is still alive is still present at the end of the film and in that way sorry serious (laughs) (laughs) and in that way i think the real hero of the story is kanamori like she's this producer character that no one wants to run into you know her methods are whatever needs to be done i will do it she's hardcore she's always writing her creative team to get them to produce but it's 
it's honestly true that without people like that, creatives wouldn't produce anything at all, you know, for the most part. <laughs> oh, like, one of, like, the show that, like, I will say, uh, for those listening, this was almost my, this was, I, this is our second Troy Pick show. Um, the first Troy Poison show I did, I had, but was, was, no long, was no longer available for streaming at the time. Was, sadly. Yeah, sadly, was Shiro Bako. And, like, part of the reason for picking that one is because the main character of that show is a production assistant of that show and so that's a character who's getting to see every aspect of the process of the process of creating a animated television series and so um i, I appreciated that show for, the, for it captures that sense of like of the passion of all of a lot of the people involved in the process but also how thing uh, how you get conflicts uh and the way the gears can sometimes not mesh properly and the process of getting those things straightened out. It is more opt. It, it is it's still optimistic and um, idealized take um, on the process and of making anime, but it does get more into the big picture commerce side. Though a lot of that ends up coming through, like coming through in different ways. Um, it's so it met in almost like by through metaphor in um in Ezokin. instead of having to deal with a production committee of a record label and talent agencies and that sort of thing you're or having to manage your business um, or manage the production process with like several different animation studios uh to help with animation work instead it's trying to work with here we have them working with the art club to try and get backgrounds made um working with um like outside musician on one of the last like, like one of the big conflicts with the show like for the finale of the series is um the music that they, they work with an outside person for music for to get a piece of music for the conclusion of their final animated short for that the show covers and what they get doesn't fit with what they don't plan to do for the animation. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge problem. And they, they tell you all the reasons why it's a huge problem. Um, and it just shows that if one link in the chain snaps, then suddenly the entire production is in danger, you know? And it's on a micro level because it's a, it's a little school club, right? But it, it's the exact same principle on a macro level when you're dealing with professionally produced um, anime from studios. <laughs> Yeah, I would say th also what this sh the thing this show what this show really made me do well two things this show really made me want to do afterwards. One was they eat a lot of yakisoba in this show, so I ended up going to get yakisoba for noodles <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but also, um, wait, like as soon as I finished rewatching the show again, I, my first thought afterwards is I need to go rewatch the um, Daikon shorts, uh, the Daikon's film shorts. Mm -hmm. uh, since so those are on YouTube because those are in a lot of respects a very similar project a, a real world version of the kind of projects that are getting made um, that they're making in Keep Your Hands Off Ezekin except uh, the Daikon film projects were being made by college students instead of high schoolers but the point kind of still stands yeah I've, I've seen a lot of shorts um, I have several friends who went through the, the animation track at my art school um and I think they're... We have friends in animation. I have friends in animation. I think shorts are underappreciated. I really do. It's like short stories in fiction. It's actually harder to write a solid short story than it is a novel quite often because you have to be ruthless about editing. You have to have a complete story, mood, everything in a tiny fragment of time. And um, for animation, that's multiplied because then you have to worry about all of the imagery, the movement, the sound, everything. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of animated shorts. I think they should get they should get more recognition. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you watched the um, Daikon Four short, either of you? I think I I watched. Not, not, not one, recently, <laughs> but yeah, not recently. All right, <laughs> so it, it is worth rewatching it again. Um, the version that it's. it's the version that's on YouTube right now is a uh, lightly remastered Laserdisc rip. There's an AI upscale version that's out there as well. Uh, again, taken from the uh, Laserdisc. So this was a 
For those who haven't seen it, this is a short film that was made by a group of college students at, or and some former college students from the Osaka University of Arts for DICON, a anime convention, or not, or anime, a science fiction rather convention, um, done in Osaka. It's basically sort of part of like the Japanese World Con, like not, not Japanese World Con, the Japanese equivalent of World Con or I guess Western Con uh, circuit, where it's it's where they have their um, Seiyun Awards, which is the Japanese equivalent of the Hugos. Um, and when it's held in Osaka, they call it Daikon because it's um, a well, it, it's a double pun. It's a Daikon big convention, also Daikon because the radish. Um, and so a bunch of these um, college of these college students put together animated shorts, one for for the third and fourth um, of these conventions. The third of them was set to Twilight by Electric Light Orchestra. Um, it's really gorgeously animated. Uh, features very like it is blatantly, flagrantly fi- uh, violating copyright in so many senses in, in the way that fan works do. Um, <laughs> and what happened is there was an executive from Bandai at the uh, convention. They saw the short and said, "Hey, you want to make a movie after you did this, like a full-length movie?" And they said, "Sure." And the stu- and, and the, the this Daikon film group. Um, ended up becoming Gainax, and their first movie was Royal Space Force Rings of Honiamis, and the rest, as they say, is, is history. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, like it, it's it's an, an insanely impressive work of uh, animation um, for the Daikon Force short. So I do recommend people check that out. And it's like um, also, I, and again, for those listening to the podcast, if you, for, if you have not watched, keep your hands off as you can. Really check it out. It is a, oh. Excellent. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in the show that anyone I know of would find objectionable. So this is something you could watch with your kids. Yep. If... Quick shout out um, mm-hmm. to the fact that there is no fan service or um, anything of the sort in this show, which is a welcome breath of fresh air from a lot of <laughs> anime that I've watched. <laughs> yep. Uh... The, 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 the high school students look like high school students as opposed to adults, adults with unrealistic proportions. Thumbs up. <laughs> also, the cast is remarkably diverse. Um, like, of like the, the of like the major student characters, um, like about half of them are people of color, um, which is really nice. If you are looking for some um, representation in your anime, uh, that is definitely one, a good one to go with. Uh, again, the show is as this recording currently streaming on Crunchyroll. I did check to see if there's a physical media release. Not yet. It is subtitled only. So if you do have problems um, managing action and uh, subtitles, uh, you may need to watch this over a couple times just to, just to kind of juggle Also, that. quick shout out to the fact that it is hilarious. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Worth noting, this is a comedy. <laughs> this is a comedy, and it is an absolutely hilarious comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've been talking about how serious it is. The humor is amazing, and it's not... And thankfully, this isn't humor that's at the expense of anyone. This is humor due to situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the absurdity of life. There's oh. some, there are some nice puns that even... Like, they transfer over to the subtitle a little bit. <laughs> Can of money was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep. The, the robot club is hilarious. Uh, the so- robot club reminds <laughs> me of robot of like the, you know, the junior robot club you will find in any high school, or at least that was in my high school. That yep. was an undisclosed number of decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> so many things it about the two. setting are hilarious. <laughs> the insane yep. list of clubs. <laughs> yeah, because apparently like each club only has three or four people in it. So there's like there for every interest there was a club at this school uh insane things the like, carbohydrate alliance or something revolu- like yeah. yeah revolution yeah <laughs> carbohydrate revolution club? they were my favorite running joke like that, that yeah they that, were good. that club like I, there were also like when they had the um when everyone was giving their pitches i do kind of wish that we got like i i feel like that that was if they'd done something similar in the u.s like the, the one joke that would have been happening with the U.S. animated series that I think would have worked here would have been the vaudeville hook. Yeah. yeah that would fit right in. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, like the theater, instead of the, instead of the campus security club, it the, the theater club just pulling out the vaudeville hook and yoink. <laughs> the campus security club, which is like they were the a- SWAT team. Oh my God, they <laughs> were <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Campus Security Club is like <laughs> at least four dozen people in full SWAT gear. Full SWAT gear. They like, just barge like, in. What? Just, just like, like, like riot. How are they? Fields. How does this club make money? <laughs> so and good. They're all like actually armed with paint guns. <laughs> and it's like, what? The whole thing has that beautiful sense of heightened or, like, slightly off of true reality that is just so joyful, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's very much... it. Honestly, parts of it felt like Shakespearean, co- like, absurdity. Almost. Like, yeah. this, is, this is real life up to, you know, up to 11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was so fun. That, yeah, that was... This was it's it's there are other comedies which I like which which I I will say I like I have laughed harder at, but Azokin is like really great and the com I, some of the comedies like I like were a little higher on the just the, the straight laughs strictly comedy um tend, did tend to lean either a little more absurdist or a little more farcical, but this is like a nice even balance of uh, general narrative. That is separate from comedic hijinks, um, and also with this layer of comedic absurdity on top of it. And if you are involved in creative work at all, you will resonate with so much of this show. <laughs> like I was just constantly nodding my head up and down, like "Yep, yep, yep." yep. yep. <laughs> That's exactly the way it is. I, I can't even express how beautifully um, the creative struggle is expressed here. <laughs> Any other um, thoughts to bring up on Keep Your Hands Off Isokin? Hmm. I could honestly talk about this show for hours, um, but I will just I'll just conclude with watch it. Just <laughs> just watch it. It's it's great. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to watch a show that's interesting and leaves you feeling happy, watch the show. Watch Keep Your Hands Off Isokin. So, us and Elvis Costello can't be wrong. So therefore. <laughs> Watch, keep your hands off as you can. So, might as well like, lay out what we're planning to do for next month's show, so that for people listening to this, if they want to watch along, um, they can do so. Uh, our next show we're going to be doing is going to be Boogie Pop and Others. Um, the show is also currently streaming on uh, Crunchyroll, and this one has this one has a dub for those who um, prefer that, and it also has a physical media release if you want to if you don't have good streaming in your air, uh, internet in your area. Um, so there's that option as well. Uh, this is an adaptation. The show will be an ad- is a adaptation of a series of several installments of a se- series of light novels from the nineties. And we'll get more into that next time. Look forward to it. Woo. All right. And stop recording.